Thank you and good afternoon. So today I'm speaking to you as a psychologist, so it'll be the psychologist hat that's on. I am the presentation, so don't look for anything fancy behind me. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is summarized as how do I change the way I think to change the way I feel? How do I go from an unhealthy negative emotion to a healthy negative emotion, not a positive emotion? Because as you know, there are many things that can happen in life, in family, at work, that aren't cause for celebration or to throw a party. But the problem is when we think about things in a certain way, our sympathetic nervous system kicks in, and it's either fight or flight, okay? And both are, you see them equally throughout, throughout um, situations. So as a way of background, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm trained in New York. I've been teaching at the medical school here for the last 12 years. Uh, my clinic is right next door in Burj Mundur. Um, and I've been, uh, I, work, I, I personally work with adolescents and adults, but we have people that work with children. Uh, we have a center for kids who are autistic and have de developmental delays um, and have been practicing since 2009. So at its core, what I'm going to be talking to you about is something that has been part of human civilization and human understanding for thousands of years. Epictetus, over 2,000 years, years ago, said that people are not bothered by things, rather they're bothered by the view they hold of those things. Shakespeare came out 500 years ago and said things are neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. In other words, it's not a situation that leads to you being angry or depressed or anxious. Now, as doctors, you know, sometimes it is not the situation. Sometimes it's because the brain has faulty mechanisms. But for now, let's, we're going to assume that most of it has to do with this, because part of what we're going to be talking about as well today is not just the emotions that we have that are unhealthy, but our emotion towards that emotion, okay? Sometimes people are angry that they're angry. I have one client I work with in a neighboring country via Skype who gets angry when they're angry. Guess what happens to them when they get angry? They explode, right? Or I'm angry that I'm depressed, or I'm depressed that I'm anxious. So even in situations where the person's issue or has to do more with brain malfunction, their attitude towards that malfunction increases it. But we'll come to that in a little bit. So basically, cognitive behavioral therapy was born in the 1950s. There are two schools of thought. There's Albert Ellis out of New York, and then there's Aaron Beck, who's much more known out of Philadelphia. The reason I got trained in the Ellis School, because I'm a New Yorker, I have six boys, they're all born in New York. That's you know, where I went to graduate school, that's where I did my clinical training. So when I had to choose, I didn't choose this school because I thought it was better, I chose this school because it was more convenient for me. And I've been, I've, I have my final rung of training with them this summer where I'll become an approved supervisor. But Ellis broke away from psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, which is, you know, the psychodynamic therapy, which is how I'm initially trained, is fantastic. But it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, and you get to know yourself very, very well. But chances are, had you learned those tools to begin with in terms of how to manage your own stress, you wouldn't have needed as many sessions. The focus with cognitive behavioral therapy is not about the past and your childhood. It's more about, right now, here's the situation. How do I learn tools to go forward in my life? And if I'm still interested in figuring out my childhood, great, but that's not the impetus for the therapy. So I just broke away because back then, you'd, you'd see your therapist every day, five days a week, you know, for seven years. Then Carl Rogers came about with this new short-term therapy, which only needed 90 sessions. That's still quite a lot. With cognitive behavioral therapy, on average, it's 12 to 18 sessions. Some people are done with 6 to eight, 10. It depends, but it's much more shorter term. It's shorter term because it's educative. So it's not about the person is the, you know, the, God, the person that knows everything and you have to keep coming to him. No, they'll teach you the tools they have, so you start doing therapy at home. You do it through homework, you do it through rethinking situations, you do it through writing down the things that bother you during that week, that day, that, you know, however long it's been since you saw the therapist last. So at its core, we, learn, we have the client take responsibility for what they're feeling. So it's never somebody else's fault. Nobody can make you angry. You make yourself angry. Nobody can make you anxious. Nobody can make you depressed or make you feel guilty. You do that to yourself. So at its very core, and I gave you all a cheat sheet. Some of you might have had have it in Arabic. I'm sorry, I can email it in English if you want. Um, but there's a cheat sheet there which summarizes the, the entire time I'm going to be speaking. So, so and you can look at that later. But the A, so we, we go through, we have six letters that we work with. The A is the activating event, the thing that happens. You know, my father did this, my mother did that, my husband did this, my, something happens. Or the guy just, you know, crossed in front of me in their car and didn't give me a signal, which of course never happens in Kuwait. Right? So something happens, or something can happen in the emergency room, comes to something can happen with a, my, my, your colleague, your senior, your junior, something happens. The C is the consequence, which can be emotional, behavioral, 
or both. Most people l w work in what we call an AC connection. If that thing didn't happen, I wouldn't feel this way. My favorite example happens in the jungles of Africa and in the shopping centers here in Kuwait. Salfet khizni wa khizik. You guys know this? Right? Lo ma khizni shamat lagayta. Right? Lots of people get stared at, not everybody gets angry. And those that get angry, not everybody hits. So it can't be that the stare led to me being angry. So what's missing is the B, the belief, the i'tiqad, the belief. So if my belief is something like, no one should ever look me in the eye, because if they do, they're saying I'm not a man, what will people say, right? It's that belief that made me angry. So for our purposes, for a belief to be considered an irrational belief, it leads to one of the big four emotions, anger, anxiety, guilt, depression, okay? For this to happen, the belief has to be made up of one, two, three, or four things, and these are all in the sheet I gave you. The first is a demand that things should or shouldn't be a certain way. My senior shouldn't have told me to do that, it's below me. My junior should do what I tell them. This, is, and especially when it comes to, to marital couple, to couples who come to me who are married, it's always like this, he should do this, she shouldn't do this, it's always the should. When we think in terms of shoulds or musts, we get angry, anxious, or both. So the first step is to change the should or the demand to a preference. I wish, I hope, it would be preferable. Sometimes you'll have a client who'll say, you know, doctor, when I was a child, I was abused and that shouldn't have happened. And I'll say, you know what, you're right. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna subject you to this in inquisition based on this model because some things just shouldn't happen. But how is thinking about it in that way going to help you? Right? And this is the core of what we're trying to do, is how do I regulate my emotions so I can make the best decisions for me? Not for society, not for other people, because at the end of the day, the only thing you have control over is the way you think about things. You have no control over your partner, your parents, your colleagues, even your kids. You can pretend you have control over your kids, but you don't. Okay? And the more you're able to control the way you think, the more you can control the way you feel. So the first thing is the demand. The second thing is what we call frustration and tolerance. I can't stand it. Okay? We want to change I can't stand it to I can stand it. And the idea being that when I think in terms of I can't stand it, I'm going to get anxious or angry. The third one is what we call HTA. It's horrible. It's terrible. It's awful. Most people coming in for a first session, I ask them to rate the situation they came on based on a scale of one to 10. And without looking at the sheet, and sometimes I'm wrong, but not many times, I'll say, I'll bet you gave it between a seven and a 10. How did you know? I said, well, I know. But what if a 10 was somebody close to you dying or somebody getting very sick? Would it still be a, would it still be a seven or an eight? No, it wouldn't. Okay, so let's agree that whatever it is you wrote about is bad, but it's not horrible. Because what we tell ourselves about the situation is going to highly influence how we feel about it. And the fourth one has to do with more with depression, which is more of a rating of a person. So instead of that's a bad person, we learn to say he's a good person who did a bad thing, maybe many bad things. But we don't rate a person because we're too complex as human beings. So that's, that's, the, C, that's, that's the D, the disputation. So we, the A is the activating event, the thing that happens. The C is the consequence. Why, did I, why didn't I say B first? Because we always go for the A or the C first. So if you're feeling one of those emotions, anger, anxiety, depression, try to think about what you think led you there. And ask yourself, if a thousand people went through this situation, would all 1,000 react the same way? Chances are, no. So I wonder what it is you're telling yourself that they're not telling themselves, okay? Then we go to the E, the effective new solution, the, the effective, so the emotional solution. So we don't go for practical solutions we go for emotional solutions because there's a difference between feeling better and getting better. If I don't like that person at work or that situation or that, that, that thing I've been asked to do and I avoid it, I might feel better, but I'm not getting better, okay? And the last one is this idea of, is, is the new emotion. So we wanna move anger to being annoyed. So unhealthy negative to healthy negative. Depression to being disappointed or sad. Ang anxious to being concerned or worried. Guilt to remorse. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So I told you I have six boys. My third one, if it was my father's son, I have no idea if he would have survived making it to 15. I find myself saying, you know, he shouldn't be acting this way. And then I'll ask myself, does this belief help you? These are the key questions. 
for disputations, the D. Number one, does this belief help me? Not is it right or wrong. We don't judge what he's doing. Does it help me? And the answer is, if it's making me angry or depressed or anxious or feeling guilty, it's not helping me. Okay. Question two, who says that he shouldn't act this way? Where is the evidence? Okay. Typically, when we say you know, things shouldn't happen, we have all these reasons in our head, but they only exist in our head. They exist nowhere else. Okay. Question three, is it logical? So is it logical that a 14-year-old boy wouldn't act this way? By definition, 14-year-old boys are mentally deranged. Right? So since it failed that test, here's where we state the thing. We say, you know, I wish he didn't act this way. So not the demand, but a preference. I don't like it, but I can stand it. Atemmel. Not meaning that I don't interfere and raise him and tell him what he did is wrong. The, the thing is that if I say he shouldn't do this, I can't stand it, I'm either going to fight with him, and that's not going to work, or I'm going to leave the room, and that's not going to work. So we don't want to be victims to our sympathetic nervous system. So we calm ourselves down, and then we intervene. So first the emotional solution, then the practical solution, not the other way around. And one, one final thing when it comes to this kind of thinking, the meta disturbance, what we talked about, when both the A and the C are emotions. I'm depressed that I'm depressed. Or I'm anxious that I'm anxious, which leads to panic attacks. Right? And so, so what I tell my clients, I say, you know what? What if you're going to feel anxious for the rest of your life? How does it help you to be upset that you're anxious. And I'll give two examples. One example I give is, so growing up, my, my parents sent me to the US to a summer camp in, a, in the woods growing up, and if you couldn't tell from the accent. So I used to go every summer in the woods, and my kids go there now when I visit them. It's the same, you know, there's no internet, no phones, no television. Uh, they're just in the woods having fun. So I visit them every summer, and I went, went to visit three years ago. And Chuck, who was there when I was an eight-year-old boy, he's still there, he's in his 70s. He's taking care of my kids, he used to take care of me. And he doesn't let me stay in a hotel because I'm in Ahlul Bayt. I have to stay at the camp, which is fantastic. It's nice. I, I wake up thinking I'm 10 again. But three years ago, I was taking the staircase outside Chuck's cabin. And my brain decided, even though I've been taking these steps since the 1970s, my brain decided the third step was not there anymore. So I fell. And my leg got caught between the last step and a tree root that was protruding because of the rain. And my leg snapped. I mean, they could, there was a, comp very, a compound fracture. They couldn't find all the fragments. My surgeon referred to my ankle as Humpty Dumpty, which is funny now. I can tell you it was not funny then. Okay? So I went through three surgeries in the States, eight months, got stuck, took a year to learn how to walk again, another year to, to lose my limp, and there's still pain every day. It's not, oh my God, I can't, but sometimes at the medical school, like this morning when I gave my lecture, I felt a bit of pain. And sometimes I say, you know what, I shouldn't feel this pain. What do you think happens to the pain when you think that way? It goes up. Right? So the idea here is that there are some things, in fact, most things, that are just not under our control. And the more we focus on them, the more stressed we make ourselves feel. So it's not my leg that's causing this. It's not depression. It's not anger. It's me. And the more responsibility we take for our emotions, the more we can keep our sympathetic nervous system in check. So just a quick summary. The A is the activating event, the thing that happens. The C is the consequence, which can be emotional, behavioral, or both. Once we have those two, we go for the belief. What's the belief? For the belief is to be irrational. It's made up of one of four things, number, or all of them. Number one is a demand. So we want to change the demand to a preference. Number two, the frustration and tolerance. We want to change I can't stand it to I can stand it. Number three, instead of saying it's horrible, it's terrible, it's awful, HTA, we say it's bad, but it's not horrible. And number four is we don't give a value over a person. We value the behavior, not the person. Once we, have the, once we know what the irrational belief is, we go to the disputation, which has three core questions. Question one, does holding that belief help you? Not is it right or wrong, but does it help you to think that way? And if it's causing you one of these emotions, anger, anxiety, depression, or guilt, it's not helping you. Question two, where is the evidence? Who says that this should or shouldn't be the certain way? Most times, if not all times, nobody outside of your head says these things. And the third thing is it logical. Now, if it fails that test, we, this is the D. We go to the E, okay, which is the new emotion. Sorry, the new, the, new, uh, the, new, the new thought. Basically, the emotional solution. So instead of, the, you know, this should or shouldn't be, I wish, I hope, it would be preferable. I can stand it. And this leads us to the effective new feelings, the unhealthy negative emotion. Hopefully that was helpful to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.